if I'm laying in my casket, what's the one thing that I wish I would have done? Mm. And I was like, I wish I, I wish I would have tried. Mm. I wish I would have tried. Yeah. Or contributed, even if it never made a Netflix special, at least I, I tried and see if it was there. Welcome to the Etsy Podcast. I'm your host, Justin McRoberts. My guest on this episode is longtime friend and co-creator Scott Erickson. He and I created and released the book Prayer, 40 Days in Practice a few years ago. His partnership has been not only really enjoyable, but enriching and transformative. Scott's work as a visual artist and a storyteller comes from and carves out what I consider a vital and sincerely unique place in American religious culture. Unique to such a degree that I've divided this interview into two parts, of which this is part one. My intention is to give you the opportunity to be challenged, inspired, and moved by an artist whose work I consider right for this moment in our shared history. Check it out. So where are we are now? We are, we're, I know we're in your studio. Tell me, like, what is this? We're in my backyard <laughs> we, we in, in backyard. a converted two room shed. It's a big shed. It's a big shed. This was a shed. Yeah. It was just this. I mean, I didn't even do anything to the floor except mop it up. It was just cement floor. This there wasn't was, like a car garage or anything? No. It's huge. This is, I don't, uh, you can put a car in here. Not anymore. Not anymore. This wall was here. No, it was just a, it was like in here was a lawnmower and hmm. stuff for the yard, rakes, lots of cobwebs, no walls, just the, you know, the outside wall and stuff, a lot of rot and things. But um, yeah, we're in our backyard. Uh, my wife and I, who are both working artists, bought our first house last year, not even a year ago, which was an accomplishment. Yeah, I Finally, you know, turned 40, bought my first house. And, uh, which is, uh, who gives a shit? It's not a competition, it's but, really not. uh, but congratulations. On thank you. you on thank you. And no, and it's really fantastic. And now we have three kids and I've, Since I used, last year, I don't believe you. I know. I used to have, uh, my studio downtown Portland okay. and a, a number of things happen. Uh, Portland got a TV show called Portlandia. Yep. Uh, I moved here along with a bunch of other people. When I moved here, I was like, uh, we missed it. We missed the golden age of You moved Florida. here from Texas? Um, te uh, Tacoma, Washington. I left, left Houston. So I grew up in Seattle. Oh, yes, yes. Took the job in Houston for three years. Went back to Tacoma because oh, okay. I got a job at World Vision. And then I got offered a job here. Okay. So we moved here. Um, but when we got here, I was like, we missed the golden age of Portland. Because Portland was growing. Yeah, it's like what Seattle... I haven't lived in Seattle in 12 years, but it's not... You know, it's not the Seattle. Macklemore raps about the Seattle I grew up in. Mm -hmm. You know, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, yeah. Que you know, Soundgarden, grunge, almost live. All these things that it was just Seattle is like tucked up in a corner. Away, you know, pe bands would like rarely come, and because, then they developed their own scene, and then developed its own scene. Yeah. And so that, but now it's Amazon land, Starbucks land, yeah, and it's. It's, and the same and it's, kind of thing grown. happened in Portland now, where it was its own, it kind of had its own, we're over here untouched. It's when it gets so expensive that creatives can't live in it anymore yeah. and they get pushed out, hence why we're in Vancouver, Washington. Which is, uh, again, part of, why, part of why I'm asking, Yeah, because we're not actually in Portland. We're in Portland. We're across the Columbia. We're across the Columbia River in another state, Vancouver, Washington, older than Portland. <laughs> <laughs> there's for Vancouver like it was a trading post yeah um, and yeah but it's we're calling it New Brooklyn like uh, oh you know, really it's, are it's, you it's, it's across the river you can still get stabbed you know but it's it's it, it's up and coming but no yeah we bought a house and in this backyard part of the big selling point was in this backyard was this like two room shed yeah that you can make room in that, that. So now it's my studio. Oh, because in Portland, it was only nine miles from my house in Vancouver to downtown Portland. Nine right. miles. That's it. Mm -hmm. But it started taking me like an hour to get home. Because all the people. Because of just traffic. And then to try to move into Portland was going to be stupid expensive. Yeah, we could have got like a and you're maybe a two bedroom apartment for what we were. We had a really amazing hookup on this house we were renting. Right. I mean, it was like a. 
a quirky house. You stayed there. One little bathroom off the kitchen. It's really cute though. But yeah, but we paid like 1200 bucks for that. Yeah. That's because it was friends and it was their first time they'd ever rented to anybody. But moving for you, man. But 12, like, like we, that in Portland would have been $2,400. Yeah. Uh, $1,200 would have maybe been a one, maybe two bedroom apartment if we could have found that. And you wanted to be somewhere, if you were going to move, you wanted to be somewhere where you could, you could afford the place as an artist, you could have a place to work because this is like, you're committed to this. Yeah. Vocationally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even if I get took a job somewhere else. So, for example, when I left Houston, really burned out, I started working for World Vision. And I it's not that I hated that job. I just I was really burned out and depressed. Uh, and I went to an office building and I worked in corporate. So always the best place to go when you're feeling burned <laughs> yeah, out so on life like, and work. <laughs> like dead cubicle. Give me land. a cubicle, please. Give me a cubicle. And let's get creative in like the ugliest uh, non-creative conference rooms and right. come up with creative ideas. Uh, but what was good about it was uh, I went to work and I left work and I didn't think about it when I wasn't there, which is what I needed to do. So it actually did work for you. It worked for me. And clock I had, in and clock out for a season. Clock in, clock out. I had good health care. So I went to a therapist and a counselor. Imagine that. I know. Uh, Imagine if everyone had that. Uh, it was, yeah, right. It was super helpful. And then... Um, but I knew, even though I was kind of burnt out on creating, I knew that I needed to keep it up. So I converted my garage, part of my garage, hmm. into a studio. And I was like, I had two kids at the time, a job. I was like, I'm just going to have to lose sleep because hmm. I know I'm supposed to keep doing this. So I would, it would be like nine to midnight, three days a week. So even, so I for, would just paint. for the time... Because you, you were working as an artist in a church. Yeah. Uh, and for a number of reasons, which maybe we can touch on later on, you like you you reached a point of burnout. Yep. And when but when, when you stepped away, like you didn't blame art and no. say art is too hard. It's no. too hard to be an artist. You needed a break from like some of the pressures that the, some of the vocational professional pressures that come along with it. And corporate actually provided the space for you. Where like I. I don't have to care about this in the same way. And, yeah. And I can have, I, like I can be, be, I can more freely approach the art I want to do because this is paying for my life. Yes. Yeah. I, I was just experimenting hmm. because for, th for three years I was working at a church. I was hired by a great church in Houston, Texas called Ecclesia and I was their artist in residence. And so I led the community as an artist and I was a leader there and, and a working artist and had a studio right. in the church. Uh, but I was making stuff all the time for very specific reasons, like that, mm. that they were like that they were didactic, that it was communal, that it was done in relationship, all this kind of stuff. And so uh, which was all wonderful. Um, and then, you know, burning out, that can be a whole we could we can talk about that. But yeah. it's. It's like something you're not in control of. It's right. like your body and your psyche are like, oh, you're done. And the way you're mm -hmm. going to be done is we're going to shut down all these systems. And right, right, right. And you just stop functioning. So when I had gotten out of that and had some time, I had nothing to create for. Um, so I just created for creating. And I just kind of experimented hmm. with... Um, I did a lot of, I, I, I don't have them anymore, but I did these like cathedral paintings. Hmm. So that's what came out when you had, when you had space and freedom to do whatever was going to come out. Of yeah. You. I was really interested. I really love cities and decay. I love like graffiti and walls. And there's a artist named Jose Parlo who does, he basically makes like faux city walls with like, hmm. it's kind of crazy, uh, just layers and layers of stuff that then gets taken away. And he does like tagging and stuff and he's got a certain style and it's just, so then when you see it, you're like, that looks like a, just some crazy city wall that's just mm. been built upon a built upon a built upon. And I like that. And so I, I started doing these things where I would like draw a whole cathedral cause I, um, just has all these lines and stuff. And then I would graffiti all over it and then I would sand it and then I'd redraw the cathedral, a graffiti all over it, sand part of it. Then I'd redraw and then like paint and stuff. So then it just built up these layers. And so you had mm. this kind of like this image, they were just 
Yeah. So just it was a lot of like physical activity hmm. and, and maybe some, some therapy in the actual maybe process. there was some therapy. Maybe I was pushing against kind of institutionalism <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And just, oh, okay. yeah. Um, but that's what I made during that time. Just kind of. Yeah. So right now. Uh, yeah. So this is a, a dedicated space to make art. And in it is like, you know, we're sitting at a couple chairs by a desk. There's a couch. There's a, a chair. This, this room is kind of like where I, I work and think and stuff. And then the back, the room behind us is like the big drawing table, the easel, all that kind of stuff. What is it you do? Like, what do you, what do you do? Cause that, right. I mean, it's, it's the artist question, you know, folks will ask you if you're, if you're, you know, like, I'm a creative. Okay. So what do you do? Yeah. So if someone's asking you, they're asking and they're really trying to figure out. Yeah. And they're not just trying to get like, you know, they got time to <laughs> fill out this party before yeah. they're the, the person that came with wants to leave. They ask you, they come to you cause they're interested in your life and, and yeah. Scott Harrison, what, what what do you do? What, what exactly do do? are you doing? Well, I'm starting to land on that uh, hmm. after years and years of working. Uh, I mean, I think there's two layers to that question. What do you do also means like, how do you make money? Is Because most because when you say like, I'm a professional artist, most people have no idea what the revenue source is because their idea is like you work for a company and they pay you. So it's. I think a lot of people just don't know. Like, or if you're a musician, they can go, well, you put on concerts, you sell albums. So I guess if you say I'm a visual artist, they like, so do you sell artwork? Is that how you make money? And can you make money like that? Uh, funny story. Like this, <laughs> I was at this event, my friend Kyle Steed, he's a painter. He was doing some art there and they were showcasing his stuff. And it was this, it was a Richard Rohr conference and this older man from Kansas who he came up and talked to Kyle because he's like, I've been doing some art in my retirement. And he's like, you know, because you can't make a living as an artist. And we're like, we're both like, I was um, like, uh, yes, you can. And he's like, what? And I was like, we're both, we both make a living as artists. That's all we do. And he's like, what? <laughs> he was legitimately confounded. Yeah, he was confounded. But that was the narrative for so long. Even my parents was like, well, you got to make money one day. You know, they, they knew it in me, but they like, I don't know how you make money as that. But like it's in Daniel Pink's book, uh, A Whole New Mind, the author, the president of Ford at the time that book was written said, we don't make cars, we make art. And so I tell people, I was like, look, uh, because of automation, because of outsourcing, all this stuff, like the only thing that we really, uh, one of the things that we can do to keep, to make us uh attractable to employers is be creative and have and the creative process. So our, when you say like, well, I think what people say when they're like, how do you make a living as an artist? What they imagine is you're in some room just making paintings, then going, will you buy this? You know? And it's right. like, no, that's not it. So what I, I tell people, I'm like, look, let me describe the projects I'm doing right now. I'm hmm. illustrating. I'm making five icons for a church that are going to become paintings. I've, I did a brand for this company. I have a book publishing deal. So I'm making two books. I speak and I perform uh, that I get paid for and I do live painting and I get hired at events and things like that. So I was like, and that all makes a little bit of something, but hmm. enough to get by. Yeah. Um, actually it makes a decent something mm -hmm. makes more than I did when I was a teacher when I was a high school teacher. Yeah. So, and in all of those things, yeah. The other half of that question is, is there a thing that so, ties those all together? Yes. Is and so what I've started landing on just by like going, what do I keep coming back to is I'm really interested in imaging the spiritual journey. That's, that's the phrase mm -hmm. I'm working out right now. And like, I keep saying it. It's I'm the like, working, it's the working title. Yeah. It's the working title. And I'm like, well, oh, that makes sense. I told you who you met last night, my friend, Kurt Kroon. We, <laughs> we were actually at the gym doing that walking, uh, those Walker, what I was on today. This is called steps, the Stairmaster. Stairmaster. Stair steps. <laughs> the, the Walker. I don't know. Walker's different. Yeah. The Walker was, comes later. I was in, uh, I was working for the empire and I was controlling an AT, AT, a Walker. Uh, no, I, um, <laughs> But I was, he was just asking me about something. I was like, dude, I don't know. I just take dictation from the silence. 
that's what I do. <laughs> he goes, please tell me <laughs> that you will use that phrase <laughs> at some point. I was like, that'll probably be my biography. Dictation uh, from the dictation sense. From I take the dictation silence. from the sense. It, it started occurring to me, you know, when you're in your own head, you just, it's easy to go, this is what's normal. Right. And then I was like, oh, my parents don't, you know, I, I create because I'm haunted is what I say. Yeah. Because every day images come to me or something and it's like, make me. And I'm yeah. like, I can't right now. I'm driving. I'll get in an accident. It's like, make me or I'll leave. And I'll be like, fine, I'll pull over and I'll draw you out. You know, right. it's, I, I am being it's in you. You I, have to do it. It's that. And I'm also being invited to some kind of dance with inspiration. Yeah. Like, where do these ideas come from? Why do they land? Like, there's a certain part of creativity, which is like, how do I accomplish this thing? Let me think through how to creatively tell that. It's more like problem solving. But there's also the, like, the the downloading that that just comes to you. The stuff that bubbles up. Yeah. Like, I wish I was a musician. Like, that's my favorite art form. I wish I was a musician. You really don't, but go ahead. <laughs> that's what every musician <laughs> says. No, you don't. But I love it so much. And, but it, that's not what comes to me. No. What comes to So I have to pay attention of like, what is asking me to interact with it? And, and I, I, it's funny. I actually found a book called The Inner Compass which is like a spiritual direction book. But I started calling it, I was like, I just pay attention to the inner compass. Yeah. Like there's something that's like, here's the next thing to do. Here's the next thing to do. It's so a part and, of what and, holds and, these things, it's like these sort of multiple uh, expressions together is depending on what it is you're hearing, depending on the dictation you're receiving from the silence, mm -hmm. this might make not, this might take the form of traditional painting. This might take the form of an icon. This might take the form of whatever. So mm -hmm. depending on what you're hearing, that dictates a little bit of, at least a little bit of yeah. how you, cause then the problem solving starts. Yeah. Here's the thing I've got. Yeah. How do I get this into other people's hearts, minds, lives? Yes. How does, and then you have to think through, and then so maybe you have to think through a business plan or go, what's, what's the product here? Yeah. Um, which is, that's one of the, you know, one of the aspects of when you decide to take what you, your passion and make it your livelihood. Yeah. Um, like I, there's something too, if you take what you love doing and you keep it sacred and untouchable by income, you can kind of do whatever you want. Hmm. But when you make it your occupation, the needs of that occupation are going to dictate what you work on. At least in part. For example, and I have a t-shirt idea every single day. Like I think of some kind of t-shirt to make, yeah. but I don't want to have, for one, I don't want to get to the end of my life and be like, I'm so glad I made a t-shirt every day. Like that's not what I want to do. <laughs> uh, so I have way more ideas than I have time for. Mm -hmm. So I've just had to get really specific on, well, how am I making a living as a breadwinner for a family? <clears throat> what is it that I really want to come? What's in me the most that wants to come out? And yeah. then just all the other stuff I have to just kind of cut. So there's a way in which away. part of, part of what ends up happening. I mean, after, because what you talked about earlier is there's the, there are the the pressures that come the, that that pressure to to create in order to fulfill mm -hmm. uh, in order to make a living that can it can drown you you can get buried underneath it but it can also be a little bit of a curatorial element in your life mm -hmm. where like I get to decide or I get to use this as like well that's a cool idea but I know it won't actually. I know that won't make me any money. I have to do things that do. So maybe this has time later on. It actually kind of provides a little bit of like some, yeah. some boundaries. Yeah. I think which you can have be to, I see really it as, healthy. I see three buckets or three plates. The first one is somebody wants to pay me to do something. Right. So there's money right there. Yeah. The second one is here's an idea. It'll probably sell. It'll probably make money. Yeah. And then the third one is like, this won't make any money. But uh, it will, it will like um, the work will go back to the other two plates by doing this work. Yeah. By doing this, it won't make any money, but it'll bring somebody else to be like, I saw that. Can we hire you to do this thing? Yeah. And you have to make time for each one of those hmm. in your in your time. So, and I don't know if I'm with so little time because of three kids and life and to do I think every project I try to experiment a bit in hmm. and push myself a little bit farther or try to create something new out of that or go if can I make something new out of this and then translate it into another area of my work or whatever
A minute ago, you talked about imaging the spiritual journey. Yeah. You've also talked about, you, in our conversation previous, talked about like creating a, like a, a visual lexicon mm-hmm. for, uh, for the practice of faith. Yeah. Which is, which some of that, as you're, you're talking about now, some of that stuff that like you hear, you see, this is the dictation you're seeing, your dictation you're taking from the silence. Some of it also is you see a lack yeah. around you in your culture. Can you talk about that part of it? Like, and it's, and this is like wide open here for critique. There is a lack of like, uh, I don't know, not even cohesive, but even like effective or even interesting visual culture for yeah. Protestant faith. Yeah. Well, let me take two steps back. One. Here's how I defined, uh, cause that's what, um, Oh no, Bruce Springsteen said the other thing. Two steps forward, one step back. You know, um, you're thinking Paul Abdul. I mean, all the greats have talked about stepping. Yeah, Bruce, Bruce Springsteen, Paul Abdul, yeah. all the greats. I'm sure Bruce Hornsby has too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how that got in there. Okay, just wanted to pull out somebody random okay. that neither of us listen to. Um, but uh, here's how I define spirituality and religion. Spirituality okay. is what's <clears throat> making in visible what's uh, making visible what's invisible Hmm. and then religion is the practices of the gold of that teaching of whatever so for me protestantism still works in a lot of ways because i'm fascinated with the person of jesus and so religion is going what was the gold that jesus was talking about and showing us and And how how can we how can we build practices around Hmm. that that's what it is right for me okay now power and wealth can come into those and then i think those become some of the causes for how religion can be very uh, hurtful because then those practices start are, are affected by greed and yes. power and uh, the otherness and 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 people and all that kind of stuff right so uh so in the practice i grew up in protestantism lutheranism uh the spaces had no art which from my understanding was from the reformation you have this very ornate catholic uh, system that's doing indulgences and all that it's very powerful it's the power in europe Hmm. and there's this pushback they're translating the bible into german uh, and Luther was like, we can give this to people. We don't need this priest as a mediator. We don't need this huge structure that's just really just taking money and it's this ruling power. Um, so let's kind of push back in the complete opposite way and let's just do a sola scriptura, you know, like all we need is scripture. Mm-hmm. And so there was this kind of like aesthetical pushback and go, let's just get really simple. Let's become Scandinavian designers is what they said. <laughs> let's get really minimal. Uh, let's let's start our own Kinfolk magazine. So part uh, of it, 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 what you see is in part of it in that history, at least in part, part of what gets pushed off the side yeah. was the, 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 the spaces in which people would enter to worship. Yes. Were... They were designed a particular way and, and that all of that was... They were designed with some intention. Yeah. Whereas... Like, well, yeah, Luther. because the Catholic, you see, like cathedrals or places they had icons. Like, I so I lived in Europe, I've, I've lived in Europe a couple of times, and I, one of the times I lived down the street from a cathedral, and I went there every day hmm. that I lived there, and because it was like three blocks away, right. and it's beautiful. The whole thing is a visual storytelling hmm. of the ideas of scripture in there, and the like you're being spoken to by the building you're in. The building, yes, the building is the teacher. And then a priest, you know, in a gathering will come in and do some teaching. But the building itself was the teacher. And you could walk around the building and see all the icons, all the stone sculpture. Like every door is a theological idea of what we exist in and who's what's the history of this. What's the cloud of witnesses? It's all there. And it was made for an illiterate culture that didn't have Bibles because the priest had a Bible and it was in Latin and nobody else did. So when people are like, that's all about the Bible. It's like oh, for 1500 years, it couldn't have been. It, it people didn't have them, yeah. they they had a priest that taught them, and then they made all these things to help remind them. Like the visual art was didactic, it was teaching, mm-hmm. it was a reminder. Um, 
so when the Bible started being made and coming into people or coming into people's hands and stuff and could be shared, like there was in a way no longer a function for the building to be the teacher because like, right. well, now we all have this book, yes. which we didn't have before. So I understand and we're told that you didn't need anything else. Yeah. And all that was wrapped in also with like this system that wasn't, that was taking advantage and, you know, money for indulgences and yeah. all this kind of stuff. So I understand where that came from, but we lost, you know, and there's smarter people who will talk about this probably. And I haven't read their books, but from my experience is because we became a culture of words and focused just on words, we, we, and we don't know what the words, we don't know what the images for the words we talk about are. Because the words were rooted in image to be. Because with. words are rooted in image. Right. Words are just a way to tell other people what we're seeing on the outside or on the inside. But insofar, but insofar as the culture became really teaching oriented in the way we understand teaching that there's a person, usually a man. Yeah. Who's going to tell truths. Yeah. That so long as insofar as it became that, then everything else was secondary and yeah. was built around like supporting this moment where a person, usually a man, would tell truth yeah. up front to people. And the rest of it was like, we just need to make sure that this thing happens. Yeah. Yes. And like all of Jesus's parables are, are visions or image stories. Hmm. Carl Jung has a quote where he says, transformation only occurs in the presence of image. Hmm. Uh, like this is my example and I'm not shitting on my dad cause he's a delightful man. Um, but he was, <laughs> cause maybe I, I might be bucking the, uh, traditional theological, I, I don't know wherever he's at, but he was like, do you think that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life? And I was like, yeah, but can you tell me what those mean? He's like, well, they mean what they say. They're the way, the truth and the life I was like, yeah, but what's a way? Is it a path? Is it a practice? Is it a rhythm? Is it a, a destination? Like, what's the way? And he's like, it is is what it means. It's the way. And I was and which is the trap of words, which is the trap of words. So then what we've become are word police. And it's like, I know you're in my camp. If you say things the way that I say it, if you say things differently, I'm like, I don't, who's this person? They're Mm -hmm. saying it differently. And what we, what either party doesn't know is like, what do you mean when you're saying that? Like, Mm -hmm. what's the image, like the way, what does that mean? And so, so it's just like a number of experiences like that have led me to this spot where I was like, we don't really, we have a bit of symbology, but we don't really know what these things mean. I, I, I think, yeah. So uh, that, so for me, I've just started going, okay. So let me tell you a story. Yeah. So I uh, made this image called forgive thy brother, which then I translate into forgive thy other, which is this one behind me. It's these two, figures embracing one has arrows in its back and one's holding the bow and has a quiver on. So mm-hmm. it's about forgiving those who've hurt you. It's the path forward in reconciliation. The first version of it was like, I took my friends Ben and Tim and they, I took a picture of them. And so it looks like them. It was this painting. Mm-hmm. And there was this place in Seattle. It's still there. It's in Ballard. It's called Cafe Verite. It's a cupcake place and a coffee shop. And they have amazing walls, like huge walls. And they would show artwork and they're right next to a movie theater, right? And a busy intersection. So thousands of people would go in there every single day Mm -hmm. uh, or at least walk by. And, uh, you know, if you're in a gallery and you have a gallery opening, that's cool. But then maybe like a few people will trickle in every day. I was like, this is the, they don't take a cut, huge walls, lots of traffic. This is a great space. So I'd, I'd show there a lot. So I did this one show. And I made a bunch of paintings and it's, I had like the stormtrooper icon and some other things in there. And it was like a Friday night art walk. So I was sitting there at a table that is, with a sign that said, I made all this. If you want to talk to me, I'm here, you know? That's good. And, uh, this forgiveness piece was up and this, this big guy in like a leather jacket comes up to me and he's like, Hey, I like your work. And I was like, thank you, <laughs> sir. <laughs> you know, and, and I was like, uh, which one's your, which one's your favorite? And he points to the forgiveness when he's like that one. I was like, oh, really? Why is that? And he goes, because I get it. Ooh. And we had a conversation after that. And I wish I was more evolved at this point in my life, but I wasn't. But I was like, oh, 
Religion doesn't own the rights to forgiveness. Forgiveness is just a human thing that we all have to deal with. Mm. And because he came to it through this visual piece, yeah. he felt the freedom to like engage in the forgiveness storyline yeah. versus like if he was to have to go through a church service yeah. and listen to a sermon. We're like, let me tell you about forgiveness. He wouldn't have gotten there. Because then it's saying like, let me tell you about our religion's version of forgiveness. And do you buy into this? Yes or no. Which comes to some of what you talk about with regards, and this is why part of the, like the impoverished nature of, of the practice of faith among Protestant white Americans mm-hmm. is what you just described in the scene was that the, the image drew out of him yeah. what needed to be drawn out with relationship to forgiveness yeah. as opposed to the way teaching normally happens where I'm trying to put something in, in I'm you. trying to put something in you. Exactly. I'm not, uh, but I'm not trying to draw something out of you necessarily as a, as a teacher. I should be. Yeah. But I'm trying to get something in you. I'm trying to get the truth in you. I'm trying to get these concepts in you. I'm trying uh-huh. to like get the Bible in you, get the word yeah. in you. Yeah. The image in that case and in so many cases is calling things out. Can you talk a little bit about the, the, the difference there in terms of like you're conscious of that when you're making, when you're making pieces Yeah, yeah, I think... the questions people ask about, like, this piece and what's it mean versus... Yeah, when I I paint at a... Specifically, like, especially at a church service, you know, I'm translating a spiritual idea into a visual language. So people come up and be like, I love this, what does it mean? Partly because they don't have the practice and vocabulary of just dissecting art or looking at art or engaging with art. They're not art critics. They're not art critics, so they've... They've been told what to think or they're like, oh, it's a landscape. I like it. But then if you give them something that's like got a lot of symbology in it, they're like, I don't even know how to approach this. And then I can be like, well, this is a house. What does a house represent? What happens in your house? You know, Uh, but I also I often start the conversation be like, that's great. What I'm more interested in is uh, the function of visual art can be what is this drawing out of you? Hmm. What did this exhume out of you? Like, did you have a conversation while you're watching this being made? And most, actually, I think 100% of the time people are like, yeah, I started thinking, oh, this, 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 this. And it was like, that's the function of it. It's a tool. It's mirroring something in you. It's, it's revealing that. It's bringing that out of you. Um, so, yeah, and what I started to learn was, um, you know, most of these subject matters like forgiveness, grace, love were ta- taught to me and talked about to me in the context of religion. Um, so I just always assigned it as these mm. are these are part of these are religious words. Mm. And then I was I started realizing, oh, no, these are it's kind of like what we do with the prayer book. We're like we pray because we're human, not because we're religious. Right, Religion right. helps giving a form to prayer, but prayer is a human activity. Same thing. Like love is a human activity. Grace is a human activity. Forgiveness is a human activity. Oh, actually everything in religion is a human activity. Would I have a quote from Henry Nowen? Somebody wrote this and they gave it to me in solitude. We realize that nothing human is alien to us. Mm. Like It's just like, Oh, it's all about being human. Right. And, and we don't own the rights to human, like a religion doesn't own the rights to human things. That just because you can, you can maybe do have an effective definition for something doesn't mean now you corner the market on its reality. Yeah. So you can be able to maybe for a particular cultural people, like you, you might be able to help, um, someone come to grips with like their need for forgiveness, the process of forgiveness or what it looks like in their life or in their culture. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that now you define forgiveness as forgiveness. It just means you've helped that tribe of people with that particular definition. Yes. That it's more specific. Yeah. So then what started interesting me was, well, what if you, what are the images for all these ideas? When we talk about these things, I started thinking about them in visual terms because that's what I do. And 
found many things that I didn't like, many things I have a hard time with. Like, for example, and it's maybe hard to do on a podcast, but well, let's... Okay, so the ancient worldview... There's a couple things. Ancient worldview was a kind of a three-tier system, right? Mm-hmm. Like, we're here on the earth. There's a, a below ground, Sheol, right? There's death below us, and then there's this heavens above us. Right. And the ancient worldview was like, uh, above us is like a shield, so if you kind of look out in expanse, it kind of feels like there's this shield above us right. and there's these lights up there. And this is where rain comes. Like God holds the in storehouses, you know, and right. it's coming through this shield, this thing like that. So there's this three tier. We think of heavens is up. We think of there's below, there's an underground. And then there's this place that we live. Um, we'll see that. So, uh, uh, that doesn't exist. My favorite, one of my favorite comedians, Pete Holmes says, I just want to win an award. So, and then he points down so you can go, I'd like to thank my Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, and he just points to the ground. <laughs> cause he's like, cause we live on a planet. We live on a sphere. There's no up or down, you know? Yeah. So we, we have spatial things built into our vocabulary that mm-hmm. don't exist, but they're saying something about how we think this, like God's up there. We're and down, that's a visual thing. We're down here. That's, that's a visual. That's why I'm visual. That's how yeah. I'm visualizing yeah. reality. God's not up there, like hiding behind Jupiter, like, and we just, you know, can't see him. Like, God's right in the midst of this. God, if, and I like Tillich's thing where he says, "God isn't a being. How we are being. He's the ground of being. He's the mm-hmm. he's the depth of being." Mm-hmm. Um. So, like, another thing I don't really like is. Uh, it's permeated our language, but we talk about the fall and that doesn't, that word is not even used in the Bible. That there's that passage, Genesis three, the subtitle put in later on says the fall, but it says, what does it say? It says our eyes were opened is that's what it says. Like we ate the fruit Hmm. and then our eyes were opened and we noticed that we were naked. But again, the visual, the way it's taught, but it's this movement from high to low. So I started going like, man, so if you view, so you view these like different levels, it's like we, so here's the theology of a lot of people is we were in the garden and it was perfect. And then we fell. So we moved down. Down. And then eventually the new heaven, new earth, we're going to rise back up to perfection. Right. And, and I was like, I started thinking about this. I was like, my whole human existence is going to be here. I'm never going to experience this like, this was perfect. And then maybe one day I'll be perfect. And I'm just setting myself up for a whole life of disappointment, comparing myself to realities I will never live in. And maybe those realities are just false dynamics that I've created, Mm. trying to make sense of these stories. And so I just had to like, but I saw it as a spatial thing. It's like, this is what we're saying. Oh, we were here. And then we fell. We fell. That's a spatial. Term. And part of what ends up happening then is it's like, we because fell. we don't, because we're not, ta- because we don't regularly address the images in us. Yeah. We end up informed by them theologically, socially, totally. emotionally totally. without no, and we don't have, there's no way to combat that. No. Cause I don't have better images when I'm, I'm, we're not on the whole, we're not curating, building, designing. There aren't a lot of people curating, building, designing better no. imagery. No, we're trying to combat this with words and teaching. Yeah. But the image gets right. Stuck. Teaching, you right, know, right. Just teaching. Becomes but the image, the becomes image like, gets stuck in there and the <clears throat> image hangs on to my brain in a way that words don't yeah. because my brain works differently with imagery than it does with words. Yeah. And the image like a building, if I'm it, like, like a Catholic building teaches me. Yeah. But I'm now I'm no longer in control of that. I'm no longer I don't have a I don't have a way to manage that. Like yeah. I'm, and so you're trying to insert yourself into the conversation, saying let let me be more intentional. Yeah. About the images that are in your life to give you, uh, to give you not just better images, but the thing that you do to help um, you understand like what it is you're yeah yeah not just better images, but like a deeper understanding of what those words mean in a way. Yeah. I think space is a huge thing you know like i i don't think we should build 
cathedrals anymore because it costs like a billion dollars to build one. Right. But we can be more intentional with the space. Like I just got contacted by this church that I might work with and they showed me a picture of their space and they meet in a round and in the center, the stage is in the shape of kind of like a cross a bit. Right. But in the middle is the table. So the entire focus of the whole group gathered is centered to the table. Right. Which is what we're all invited to. And I wrote the pastor and I was like, first of all. But they were using, they, they were because using I just, their space to teach. Yes, exactly. Regularly. And that's what I, and I told him, I was like, you, first of all, con-, I was like, awesome. That I was like, that's so great. You're teaching everybody what this gathering is about. That this is the focus, that yeah. this is where we share, that there's not this, even though we have a, a bit of a stage so we can yeah. see the people on it, that's not this hierarchy of like, I gotta, yes. we're all back here and we gotta get up here. And especially insofar as you're inviting people regularly mm-hmm. to show up in the same place. Yeah. That that becomes formative. It's the way, formative. The way exactly. you the way you enter. And Jamie Smith, uh, theologian, yep. um, philosopher at Calvin College, yep. uh, at Calvin Seminary, Calvin College. He writes, and I think it's in uh, Imagining the Kingdom. He writes about the nature of this this the nature of the tension between the, te- the what's being taught from up front and the and the form in which that teaching is taking place. Yes, yes. That we built uh, we built these buildings, and people are there's this call to action. The, you know, as an example, there's a call to action to get out there. We're gonna and the movement and this and etc. But meanwhile, like you got hundreds, sometimes thousands of people who are weekly co- invited to come sit on their asses, yeah, and do nothing, do nothing, and listen. Maybe stand and maybe sing along with a band where you have a curated group of people. Again, mostly men, almost always white, yeah, like who are doing the thing, yeah. and everyone else watches. But we're what we're teaching though. Is is this kind of spiritual personal responsibility, and that over the long haul, you're going to lose that battle. That yeah. you're going to lose. The, you lose. The, you can talk all you want. I'll get tired of your words. But in so and 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 I know what I'm doing with your words. But insofar as I, I'm being informed without my consent by the way I'm sitting, yeah. without my knowledge, without like like. I, you're always going to lose that battle if I can get into the door with you not knowing the way I'm informing you. Yeah. If you don't know how I'm manipulating you and teaching you, yeah. I'm going to win. And the, our like our system and our setup does that regularly. You come in, you sit on your ass. Those trained people up there, they do the thing. Now, I can teach that all day long, but if I don't change the setup and if I don't change the visual, it doesn't matter what I say. Yep, exactly. We use all these words and, we, and people are gathering and we... We keep using these words for the way in which they're gathering. And so then th- that starts forming what the definition of the word is. So I made this huh. video about worship, the word worship, because I was tired of musicians always being like defining it, <laughs> which yeah. is fine. But they'd be like, worship's like, yeah, it's playing together, singing. And like, eh, it's a bit more expansive than just singing together. It better be. Uh, and so I did this whole video, which was like trying to, what was like what is the image that we think of when we use this word and if you google image search which is our favorite thing to do yes. it's all like hands in the air hands in the air at sunset hands in the air at a concert you know this whole thing because what happens all these people come into a room they sit down somebody's like get up and worship and then they sit up and they look at this person on stage and they do this week after week after week that's what the word becomes hmm. the this I learned this recently and blew my mind. The diction, not by not not by not by singular moment, but by like repetitive yes. practice. The dic, this blew my mind. The dictionary isn't the definitions of words. The dictionary is a collection of how we define words. Hmm. Does that make sense? So it's not going. This is what the word means. It goes. This is how the word is used in mm. our language. Interesting. That's what a dictionary is. I just thought it was like, well, the dictionary says this is what it means. That's what it means. It's like no. This is what the. That's why you can have seven definitions because it's like the word is used this way Hmm. in these ways it's not trying to define it it's just use it's use over time how it's been how it's being used and then giving a definition for that i like that so it's like what how are we defining these words you know what what is this so the first time the word and you can go watch the video on my website but the first time the word worships used at least translated from english in from hebrew into english from hebrew is uh when it's not. It's not Genesis four or five it's or like John. It's Genesis twenty two. Really? Uh, and it's when Abraham is taking Isaac up the mountain to sacrifice him, and he says, "Stay here with the donkeys." Um, 
stay here with the donkeys. He says to the servant, Isaac and I are going to go up and we're going to worship the Lord. That's the first time the word worship is used. It's also in that passage context. is the first time the word love is used in the Bible. Hmm. So fascinating. So it's like, well, well, how's the word being used in that situation? Sacrifice, obedience, this kind of whole thing. Anyways, I, I just think we all these, you know, we're in a culture that's using words all the time, but we don't know what they mean. And then they've, what they do mean is become very like narrow and specific. And it's began, uh, and, because, and, it, because and it's been lost, bent to a particular usage over time, yes, which we, is always a cultural question. Yeah. And then what you were alluding to is gathering is forming. So what are our practices that are forming us? And when we gather a certain way, we become formed of like, that's the way that we're supposed to do it. Like, this is the other thing that hit me this year was like, everything's made up. It's all invented. Hmm. Like the divine didn't come down out of like a myth. Like, you know how in Avengers, Thanos just comes out of nowhere. (laughs) He's like, he didn't, God didn't just come out and be like, here's how I want you to gather. No, like the only thing that I can tell, at least in the Protestant tradition is if there's anything that is kind of a, you should do this every time, is communion. Jesus, and baptisms maybe one, but that's not, that's only once. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but even so that, like, even communion, the, the way it's done and the way it's practiced, even it has Old Testament roots in other meals. And it was Yes, like, totally. Was so, on. so I was like, I started reading this because I just would be at a church service and be like, none of this resonates with me anymore. <laughs> And, and, it was, and, and it was, okay but then it was, then I was like, oh, that's math. okay because yeah. it's all made up. Mm. None of this is, well, you have to do this. This is just like, this is what works for this group of people. Yeah, or and it was built off tradition. So, uh, and I just was like, man, the way these preachers talk about God doesn't make sense anymore. Right. These songs don't make sense anymore. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm just having a brand problem. That's all that I'm having. Oh, I'm not having a crisis of faith. I just don't, uh, I just don't believe in this brand anymore. And the brand is just, this is all just fabricated. It's all made up. You don't have to do it this way. What a tragedy for the, for the many, many, many folks who have not been trained to or won't or like they conflate yeah. faith, the nature, the essence of faith yeah. with the mechanics yeah. of their religious practice. So when they do lose touch with uh, not just this teacher, yeah, but teaching, yeah. And because you, what happens is you lose touch with the teacher, mm-hmm. like you disagree with this and then you go yeah. to the podcast, but you can't find one that you agree with entirely. Yeah. But then you begin, and then as soon as you start to, which is what happens, you, you know, what happened with the, with the Reformation to some degree, is you throw everything out. You throw everything Done. out. Done. Because if this is, if, 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 if it's not made up, if, yeah. if, if there's something like truly d- like divine and indwelling in the form that I've created. Yeah. And, but the form doesn't work for me anymore. Then I have to boot everything. So yeah. what a tragedy it is that, that that for a lot of folks, yeah, that's it, it's the ditching of the whole kit and caboodle, yeah. Because this particular expression, yeah, which has been so poorly taught, this this particular expression doesn't work for you anymore, yeah. And that that's not okay if it doesn't work for me anymore, yeah. Like the sick pressure to just show up on Sundays for some people, especially if you live south of the Mason Dixon, yeah. Like you. <laughs> If you're not showing up regular at church service on Sunday, you're part of a Christian family. People will start asking questions. Yeah, like, but it's this one thing. Like, how is that? How has this become fully definitive? Yeah, but it, but it is, and it and and Be- because of the silence around it, because it's not taught that way. It, yeah, and we formed the definition of my faith practice is when I've used that word church. It is a building that we're paying a mortgage on yeah. a full-time staff that we're paying with our tithes and offerings. Yeah. Uh, it, it is of, you know, that word is the definition of that word is that thing. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, if I don't, I don't want to go to church anymore. Yeah. That's not what you're saying is like, you don't want to go to the de- that definition of church anymore, yeah. or that's not working anymore for you. You don't want to be uh, at that same place at 10 30. I, I am on, on Sundays and listen to those people talk and say, yeah. And if that's what your idea of like experiencing God is or what worship is or responding to God, then, then that's the ball game. Then yeah, you have to throw it all out because you don't actually have any other kind of definition. Well, 
I heard on On Being, which we all agreed is a fantastic podcast, mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> she had Donna, John O'Donohue, which is who's now passed, but he was an Irish priest poet. Mm-hmm. And somebody asked him, she's just like, I can't. <clears throat> Excuse me. She said, I'm just, I, I can't experience God. I don't even know if God exists. <clears throat> Nothing's working for me anymore. And he just said, can I ask you to do something for a week? And she's like, yeah. And she's, he said, get up every morning and go watch the sunrise and just sit. Don't do anything else. Just go and watch the sunrise for a week hmm. and sit in silence and see what happens. And she came back to him and was like, I started hearing things again, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but not inferring that th- what we're talking about is specifically that woman's situation. No, but she's just like, this thing isn't working for me anymore. Well, cause it wasn't, the partic- it, wasn't like, the, it wasn't even the particular exercise. It was having the freedom mm-hmm. to do something that wasn't dictated by the machinery of religion that like, go do, go do this. Yeah. And that communicates a kind of trust that maybe there is something really actually yeah. happening with this whole divine presence thing. Yeah. And we can, I mean, this feels like a bit probably is. Uh, out of what we what we intended on going to, but uh, you know when Psal- when the psalmist writes the the heavens declare your wonder, and I live in cities and I look up in the heavens at night and I see like twelve stars. <laughs> yeah. I'm and then I don't I'm not witness to migrations maybe geese every now and then I'm not witness to the natural world working. I remember I s- learned how to surf in Washington State, which is like a survival sport. But I remember being out on the ocean out off the peninsula of Washington State and sitting on my board and it was a beautiful day and I could see mountains. So it was like the beach and then I could see mountains in the distance. Mm -hmm. I saw some seals, harbor seals. I saw the clouds Mm -hmm. moving. Mm -hmm. I I was witnessing the waves coming in. Uh, I saw birds flying. I, I, I was, and it was that one of those moments where I just was witness of that everything is in motion and it's working together. Hmm. And I was just one piece of that all working together. I was a part of that ecosystem. I wasn't on a road in my metal car above that ecosystem. I was in actually in that moment. I was like, oh, I'm part of this ecosystem. It was kind of your own watch the sunset moment. Yeah, it was the own watch the sunset moment. But I am because of the comforts of reality, I can take myself out of that system Hmm. and I can be above that system. And I don't have to participate or control it, you know, until a hurricane comes and we all have to evacuate. But, you know, like I have like I have this false sense of control. So I miss a part of a spiritual, a divine experience because of our technology and my comforts in those things. And so what? Yeah. What what John, I think what he was saying to this woman is like. Yeah, maybe you're missing out with microphones and liturgy and buildings and stuff. And like, why don't you go connect back to the system that we're all in? Mm. I mean, this is what the I think the poets and the psalmists and the the mystics and they're speaking about is like we're you know, we're God is God is not separate from these things. God is in these things, and we understand God when we are witness and participating in these things. Thanks for listening to part one of my interview with Scott Erickson. Keep your eyes and ears open for part two. In the meantime, you can learn more about Scott and check out all of his work by visiting scotterickssonart.com. Not just scotterickson.com, scotterickssonart.com. You can look at and pre-order the book that we made together at 40daysprayerbook.com. That's the number 40 and then daysprayerbook.com. And if you'd like to support this podcast and the work we're doing here, jump over to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com, backslash Justin McRoberts, or just jump to Patreon and search my name. We'd love to have you on the team. Thank you.